Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We started in Acts in, after Easter in 2013, and as pastors we came together and, well, it was kind of Brett's idea, but, and so we followed along. Uh, but we thought, even Pastor Nate and I thought it was a great idea because after Easter, after we see Jesus' life, his death, his, his resurrection, and his ascension, we see then that the church is commissioned to go out and spread this good news and proclaim that we have salvation through Jesus. And we thought, man, what a great idea it was to go through Acts because, I mean, that's what we celebrate Jesus' uh, resurrection and his ascension. And then we get to see, what do we do next? What do we do with this good news? And so we, we saw that in Acts over the last four years, and it's been amazing sermon series. It's one of my favorite because I, I love the commission that it gives us. And it always amazes me when we look at, at the book of Acts and we look at the power of the gospel and how it changes people. I mean, it, it always amazes me. And I love it when I see people that don't know Jesus come to know Jesus and, and love Jesus for what, who He is and what He has done for us. It, it always amazes me. I know it changed my life for sure because growing up, I, I really never knew Jesus or who Jesus was. And I always thought growing up that, um, you know, I didn't, really didn't have a dad in my life for almost all my life. I would go probably 10 years without even talking to him. And so I thought, well, if there is a God, how can he allow this to happen to me? And so growing up as a child, I wanted nothing to do with God. Absolutely nothing. I mean, people invited me to church, and I, was, I would make fun of them. And I would tell them, don't even ask, because I don't, I don't want anything to do with it. But, you know, being a, a kid, a teenager, and there was this girl, and of course her Dad was a pastor, so I thought, man, she's an awesome Christian girl. I'm going to start going to church with her because I want to date her. Well, she kind of tricked me, and I went to church with her, and all of a sudden I, I saw Jesus for who he was, and I wanted him. I wanted him in my life, and he changed my life to where I was going down a path that would, of drugs and just living for myself and coming to know Christ truly changed my life. And I know it also changed my wife's life as well. And so the girl I went to church with and is now my wife, and I thought, you know, I wanted to marry this, this girl, and so I proposed to her, and, and we got married. But come to find out, it wasn't until after we got married that she came to know Jesus. I'm like, how is this even possible, right? I mean, she, she went to church all of her life. How in the world is this even possible? Because I would almost say she was in a more dangerous spot than I was. You see, she went to church. She grew up in church. She was raised knowing the scriptures. No, I would say knowing, but also knowing to do what is right and what looks good. And so she knew how to act the part. So on the outside, it seems like she was doing everything correct. But yet she kept always asking the kind of the question of, how do you know that you're saved? And that's a question we ask ourselves a lot, right? Is how do we know that we are saved? And then when she started understanding what grace truly was and how that she didn't have to earn her merits, that all she had to do was put her faith and trust in Jesus, look to him, knowing that she's going to sin and not be able to follow the law, but it's there to point her to Christ and to repent of sin, that's when her eyes were truly opened up and she could see what grace was and how Jesus gave her mercy 
and how she could repent and put her faith and trust in him. And it changed our lives from there. And as we, just as a testimony, as we grow closer to Jesus, it's like we grow closer to each other as in, in marriage. And it's truly amazing, and especially if you're married out there and you go, man, how do we work through some of these big issues? It's, it's looking to Jesus. And as y'all grow together in, in Christ and Him, you will grow closer together because that is what your marriage represents. Is, uh, it represents Jesus and His bride, His church, those who believe in Him. But as we come to the end of Acts, I just want us to take a quick look and see how the gospel actually changed Paul's life. Because we're ending with Paul, but yet Luke does a weird ending. But I think we, to understand it, we have to understand who is Paul. So kind of because it's been, I think, a few years since we actually went over who Paul was in his testimony. But Paul, in Philippians 3, 4 through 6, he says that he, if anyone lived a righteous life according to the law, it was Paul. Make no doubt about it. He says in Philippians 3, 4 through 6, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, just meaning confidence in the outward appearance, I have more. So he is saying, I have more than what you can imagine. And he goes on to explain. He says, he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So he, he was living the part. As to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. See, Paul was the person who, if anybody did it right, it would be him. He was of the right sect. He was born under the right tribe. He did the right things, even as a baby. It would be Paul. And he even persecuted the church. And we see that in chapter 7 when it picks up in the book of Acts. It picks up with Paul as he has been given rights to go out and commit murder to those who believe in Christianity, who believe in Jesus, who put their faith and trust in him. And we see that with Stephen as he committed him to death and stoned him. And then the guys that stoned him came and laid their garments down at Paul's feet. Paul was a persecutor of the church. He went on in chapter 8 to ravaging the church. He was actually putting people in prison, is what it says. As he was going about, he was sent by the chief priest to do this. He had orders to do this. But then something kind of miraculous happens. And in chapter 9, we see Jesus calling Paul to repentance and faith as he is on his way to Damascus to again ravage the church. A great light shone out, he says, and a voice speaks from heaven, Saul, Saul, that was his name prior to being Paul, why are you persecuting me? And what does he ask? Who are you, Lord? With a question mark at the end. And from then on, it changed everything. It changed Paul's whole outlook on life, on how instead of wanting to go and murder Christians, now he wants to bring more to life, and he wants more people to be called to repentance and faith just as he is called. He had a desire for his people, for the Jews, but he also had a desire for the Gentiles because that is who he is constantly being sent to. And over and over we see as he is going throughout his missionary tours that he goes into the synagogues, he preaches to the Jews, the Jews reject him, and then he goes and preaches to the Gentiles. That is everyone who is not a Jew. So he goes out on his missionary journeys, and then he, as we've seen in this series of Acts, he has been um, arrested for going into the temple, supposedly bringing Gentiles into the temple and desecrating the temple, and Jews from Asia now accused him and I brought charge against him, which time after time we have saw that there are no charges to bring about, that he is actually innocent, but yet they are still seeking to kill him. And so now Paul finally arrives at Rome. It's kind of the end of Acts. Even though Jesus has sent 
others. He says, go to the ends of the earth. Rome is the epicenter of it right now. And so Paul is arriving at Rome. It only took two years for him to arrive at Rome, right? So that's a short travel. You know, we complain if, you know, if we got to drive, oh, we got to drive to Tulsa, that's an hour, you know? Paul's like, oh, I got to go to Rome, that's two years. You know, it's a little bit longer, okay? But he's been a prisoner now for about four to five years. And one of the things as we come to the end of Acts, there's really a couple big issues here that we get to see, and I want you to see. I mean, we could summarize this, but I want to draw the scripture out to you. So um, the first point that we see here is that the gospel must be taught locally and globally. The gospel must be taught locally and globally. You see, Paul, he desired for his kinsmen. So he arrives at Rome, and as he's arriving, he gets, he gets uh, processed through the, tri- through the courts, right? He gets processed through it. And he sits, and it, that took about three days for him to get processed, and he, he's allowed to actually rent a house of his own accord. So he's renting a house, and most people that are under uh, kind of cuffs and are chained to a person, they are actually got two guards. Paul actually was assigned to one guard, one guard. And so he's arriving at Rome, and we pick up in verse 16. And we get to see that the gospel must be explained and expounded locally. And so after three days, Paul calls the Jewish leaders to himself. He calls the people who are the foremost, his kinsmen, the people he's closest to. So when we go and look at speaking and preaching the gospel locally, who's the closest people to you? Who are the people you can relate to the easiest? Family? I had a uh, guy, he came down to my practice, and he's one of my uh, coaches, and he helps me coach through all the Medicare laws and everything like that, and, and he's an awesome Christian guy, and one of the things that he mentioned, he's like, James, you know, he's talking to me about my dad, and I get to talk to him every now and then, he's like, are you telling him the gospel? I'm like, well, and it's my fault because I'm kind of thinking, you know, I could do a lot more of speaking the gospel to him. And he's like, James, no matter what you say, he's still going to be your dad. He still has to love you. So go and tell him about Jesus. And I'm like, yes. So no matter who's ever the closest to you, if it's family and you're worried about offending them, you're not. They're your family. They still have to love you. So you still get to speak the gospel to them. And that's kind of how Paul looked at his Jewish kinsmen, that these even says down in um, verse 17, he says, brothers. He calls them brothers because he's still relating to them, because of their heritage, because of the prophets and um, the kings that came through the Jewish people. So in verse 16, as Paul is reporting to the Jews, he says, And when we came to, into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So he only had one. Verse 17, After three days he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me free at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So there's five things here that Paul really points out. That Paul has done nothing wrong. He's done nothing against his people, Israel. 
He's done nothing against the customs of the, of the Jewish people. And that the Romans were actually wanting to set him free. Now, we saw that early. You might say, well, yes, but didn't they want to hold Paul in prison? And the answer is yes there too. Because earlier in the chapter of, uh, earlier or previously in Acts, we see that as Paul is constantly being held prisoner, that they would set him free, but yet what did they want? They wanted to do the Jews a favor and actually hold him in prison. But they wanted to set him free. Thirdly, the Jewish opposition led to his appeal to Caesar. And so, in, in Acts 23, we see that not only was Paul forced to be led to appeal to Caesar because of this, but in Acts 23, verse 11, he says, and this is Jesus speaking to Paul, he said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. God's plan, because he is sovereign, as we heard Pastor Nate speak on, because he is sovereign, he controls the kingdom. He has created all of creation. And can the creator not be in control of the creation? Yes. So Paul has been sent to testify to the Romans about Jesus and how the good news of Jesus is our way of salvation. And so that led to, fourthly, Paul being a prisoner for believing in the hope of Israel. And also he is a witness to the Jews at Rome, so as we just saw right there. But the lastly, he is a prisoner for believing in the hope of Israel. Now, Paul had hope for Israel. I want us to define this term. When we use the term hope, how do we use it? We can hope in a lot of things. I can tell you, like when, you know, kids' birthdays or Christmas or anything, and if they watch any, if they even turn on the television, right, what do they see? All these, like, commercials of toys. Dad, I hope I get that Nerf gun, you know? Oh, man, all of a sudden, they use the term hope, right? And as adults, we do the same thing, right? I mean, if my wife and I are driving through Walmart parking lot, sometimes we go, oh, I hope we get princess parking. I'm not saying I do this, but occasionally we add to that hope by having one of our kids or my wife go stand in the parking spot <laughs> as I pull back around. I add to the hope a little bit, right? But when Paul talks about the hope of Israel, What's he talking about? He's talk, talking about the hope of eternal salvation. Paul's desire was locally for his Jewish kinsmen. He wanted them to know Jesus. Because in John 14, 6, he says, Jesus said to him, said to his apostles, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's only through Jesus. There are no merits that we can hope for or that we can do that's going to earn us salvation. And the Jews, they believed that following their customs, following their laws, they would have salvation because of their right doing or their merits. I think Charles Spurgeon kind of sums it up best right here when he says, without Christ there is no hope. You know, if we hope for a lot of things. We hope for our marriage to work. We hope to raise our kids good. But without Christ there is no hope. Because they might grow up and they might be the best moral kids, just like my wife. You know, my wife was morally, she was, she was set. She was a great person. But without Christ, there's no hope of eternal salvation. You might raise your kids to be great kids. They might do great things. But without Christ, there is no hope of eternal salvation. So that is why we raise our kids, to give them hope in Christ. 
And I want you to see in verse 22 here, because this is so typical of our society, right? Read with me in verse 22. It says, But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Now, let's just stop right there and talk. Because is that not the typical way of our society? That, oh, you talk about Christianity to a group of non-Christians. They're like, oh, man, here's, here's a weirdo, right? Because it's kind of spoken against. Or maybe you're going against um, abortion, against society. And all society kind of has this view of abortion. I'm not saying that there's not a group of us that, that are against it, but that's kind of the typical way society works, right? Had to have a prejudiced view, a, a preconceived notion or maybe an idea that before someone even talks about it, you have shut your mind off to the notion, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, right? I mean, isn't that how society works? And I think when we come to the Bible and we come to things that are difficult to understand, maybe we even disagree with, if it's in the Bible, we can't have a preconceived notion that I have all the all the views correct, right? We have to be sanctified through the Word of God. We have to be more like Jesus. We have to be made right. And that comes through hearing the Word of God. So if that's you, please don't have a preconceived notion. Check yourself out and see, do I already have a preconceived notion of Jesus, and is it right? Because this is why we get to talk about the Word of God. So as Paul brings them in, and he tells them, you know, his case, he brings to him his case, he also gets, he gets another meeting with him, right? That's good. When we're talking to people about Christ, we want to meet with them and talk more about Christ. So they wanted to hear from him. And so on the second part of expounding the gospel locally, we see how Paul proclaims the word of God. We see how he proclaims the kingdom of God. Verse 23, he says, When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. Actually, around that time, there's about a million people in Rome. I mean, that's a huge metropolitan city, right? If I can get that word right. And there was actually about twenty to 50,000 Jews living in that city. So they, you can imagine when it says great numbers, I can imagine that great numbers actually showed up. And from morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And you all are probably thinking, man, we're glad Brett didn't see this sermon, right? Because um, Paul actually gave a sermon from morning till evening. But he shows us four different views here on how to expound the gospel. Four different views of preaching the gospel. The first is Paul preached Jesus. All day long, he preached Jesus. And he was wanting to point to them Jesus. And he used both the law of Moses and the prophets. And he constantly was trying to show them Jesus. And we know this is the way that we need to preach the gospel and we can use both the Old Testament and the New Testament. I come across so many people that all they're worried about is the New Testament. I'm like, it's still the same message. We're saved by grace through faith, even in the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, in Luke 24, 44 through 47, we, we see Jesus as he has been resurrected. And he's going, he sees a couple walking, and he said to them, um, or he comes to him, he, sorry, he comes to his apostles and says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name, to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So, 
that all things must be fulfilled in the Scripture has to point to Jesus. We have to constantly look to Jesus. When we're talking to people and preaching to them or proclaiming Jesus to them, it has to be pointed to Him. So many times we want to try to work, try to get someone to do something or show them, act the gospel, but yet are we giving them the good news of Jesus? Because verse 47, repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed. So as we're talking, this is what we need to be talking about. This was Paul's hope, and this should be our hope too, that we point people to Christ. He expounded, the second part here is he expounded, he testified, he tried to convince or persuade the Jews to believe in Jesus. So if you're talking to someone about Jesus, it can't be like, oh, yeah, you need to trust in Jesus. No, that's not what he's saying. He says you need to expound. This word also means you need to give a heartfelt conviction, a testimony. As you heard me speak about mine, it's, you know, that encourages other people, right? It kind of gives that, it hits home. So if you're just kind of mo- like, oh, like, oh, I got to tell someone about Jesus today. No, it's, you, ha- you, you got to tell someone about Jesus today. You have to expound on it. It has to be heartfelt. That's what Paul did. He tried to persuade people. And the third point is, Paul preached the kingdom of God. Now, what does this mean, the kingdom of God? He's testifying to the kingdom of God. You know, this appears only a few times in the whole entire uh, book of Acts. Luke begins with it, and now he's ending with it. And what does the kingdom of God mean? I mean, this is a, this is a big thing. You know, in the Old Testament, as he's relating to the Jews, they, they didn't use this term very much. So why would Paul use this term as he's actually talking to Jews if they really don't understand it? And I think the point is, is that they understood that God is king. And therefore now, Jesus being God is king. And here's what I mean. In Luke 16, 16 through 17, this is Jesus speaking. He says, the law and the prophets were until John. The law and the prophets were up until John the Baptist. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. And everyone forces his way in forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. So what's he saying there? He's saying up until John the Baptist, it's been the law of Moses and the prophets that has pointed to Jesus. But now the king is here and the kingdom of God is through Jesus. And you can't force your way into it. It's only through Christ that we have salvation. And God is in control, is what he's saying. I am in control. And with God being in control, because we, we have trouble with that sometimes. People want to be in control of their own lives. They want to have their, kind of make their own destiny. Like, oh, I, I want to choose God, and if I don't want to choose God, then I don't have to choose God, right? But do we really want that type of control? Do we want to leave our life up to chance or luck? Or would it be better to put our faith and trust in someone who is in control? So he's the sovereign king, and he was sent on our behalf. And how nice is that to know that there is a king, the almighty king, who has come down from heaven, come to earth, suffered the same way we suffer, been through the same trials we've been through, same struggles, can relate to us and sympathize with our weakness. Hebrews 4.15 Do we not want to relate to someone like that? To follow someone who did it 
came down here and did not sin, but yet took our sin upon himself, died on the cross on our behalf, so we might be redeemed, that we might have redemption, we might be cleansed of sin. I pray that's what we want to put our faith and trust in. And Paul exposited Scripture. You know, Paul had just been through a shipwreck, right? And he landed off the island of Malta, which is a small little bitty island. Just You got the toe of Italy, Sicily, Malta. So he's kind of out there in the Mediterranean a little bit. And Paul, what did he do? As soon as he got to the island, they're getting their little firewood. They're freezing cold. It's been... They've been on sea for like 14 days, stranded, and yet all of a sudden the people kind of help save him and, you know, they kind of get their little fire going and what happens? He reaches down, picks up a wood, and then like a viper bites him. And Paul, what does he do? He just kind of like shakes it off, no big deal, and everyone else is like, we're waiting for this guy to die, right? But he just does a miracle and lives. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, who is this guy? And then they tell him about the, the chief's like, uh, relative, how he's about to die and has dysentery, and so he goes and heals him. And they're like, oh, it's a god. But they realize, oh, and then he goes and heals everyone in that island before he leaves. And so the people love it. So Paul is talking to the Jews here. Why doesn't he just do that, right? Why doesn't he do these crazy miracles? I mean, because that's what we think the Spirit works today. And a lot of churches today, they think the, way that, the only way that the Spirit moves is by signs, by miracles, having people being healed, or people speaking in tongues. Like, that's the way the Spirit works, right? No, it's not. That's not exactly the way the Spirit works. See, Paul knows that faith comes by hearing, by hearing the Word of God. And he exposited Scripture. He exposited the law of Moses and the prophets all day. And he was pointing to Jesus. Because faith comes by hearing, by hearing the Word of God. So people coming to faith and exposing Scripture is a work of the Spirit. And that's how we, as a church, when we prepare, we want to exposit the Scripture. Because we know you coming to faith is by work of the Holy Spirit. That's a work of the Spirit as well. When your eyes are opened and you see that I'm a sinner, and you see the good news that Jesus is a Savior, and you put your faith and trust in Him, that is the Spirit moving. That is the Spirit moving. When you see your sin and want to repent of it and turn away from it and look to Christ, praise God, man, because that is the Spirit moving as well. Christendom, an early church father here, he stated that, See again how not by miracles but by law and prophets he, he puts them to silence. And how... We always find him doing this. Paul is always doing this. And yet, he might also have wrought signs, but then it would no longer have been a matter of faith, because we know faith comes by hearing the Word of God. But he goes on to say, In fact, this itself was a great sign, his discoursing from the law and prophets. So the fact that Paul could put his Jewish kinsmen to rest and that they could not argue with him anymore because he was bringing a discourse. He was speaking the word of God through the law of Moses and the prophets. This was the work of the Holy Spirit as well. This is a big one. Charles Spurgeon says, Let this be to you the mark of a true gospel preaching, where Christ is everything and the creature is nothing, where it is salvation all of grace through the work of the Holy Spirit, applying the soul to the precious blood of Jesus. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The fact that we can point to Jesus. 
In the Westminster Confession of 1647, I love the Westminster Confession. It's a catechism, like just like we have back there, but I love it because it just gives so much scripture on a question and an answer. And we see that when the scripture is preached faithfully, and that people come to the knowledge of God, and God calls them in, this isn't a work of us, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. This is kind of what we call effectual calling, that God can actually, His Word goes out and actually now, through the work of the Spirit, brings people to the knowledge of Christ. So we call that effectual calling. And this is how the Westminster Confession kind of defines it. He says, it's God's calling is by work of the Holy Spirit, whereby convicting us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds to the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills, He persuades us and enables us to embrace Jesus Christ, freely offered to us in the gospel. Now, I know that's a little confusing, but to sum it up, it's God's work of the Holy Spirit making us see our sin, look to Him, turning to Him, and now it's not just like we're robots and we're, you know, I wish I could do a better dance than that, but now that we see Jesus, we're going to freely, our desires have changed. It's like I didn't desire drugs or living a life for myself, but now I'm going to desire God, and I'm going to freely come to Him. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So that we embrace Jesus. And I pray that you're embracing Him today. If not, I pray that the Spirit calls you to see that, because we see it in Scripture. You see this in Scripture over and over. Acts 26, 18. He says, this is Jesus talking to Paul. He says, To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by me. John 6, 44 through 45, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and that's by work of the Holy Spirit. And I will raise him up on the last day. That's the good news. That as Jesus ascended, he's going to raise us up with him and ascend with him. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they will, be all, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10, he says, What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. He goes on, verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us. Ezekiel, last one, 36, 26 through, thir- through 27 in the Old Testament, he says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. If you've been called by God and you see the good news of Jesus, and your desires are going to be different. You're not going to want to walk in sin. You're going to want to walk and obey God. And this is exciting because this is grace. This is grace that is given to us freely. This isn't something we deserved or chose. It's something that our eyes have opened. Now now we choose. And it comes through expositing the Word. And how many times do we, we, man, we want to limit the Holy Spirit. We want to put Him in this nice box and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's the Spirit working well, it's a spirit working when we exposit the text. So how did the Jews respond? Verse 24. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never under- understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, 
And with their ears they can barely hear, and in their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and turn, I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. So we see right there that some of them believed. And man, that's awesome. But a majority as a whole, the majority of the Jews disbelieved, and there became a kind of a disagreement between them. So we have to ask ourselves, because when we're preaching the gospel to people, and they don't trust or follow Christ or believe what you're saying, what do you do? You walk away and you go, man, I think I butchered that, right? Did I not present it right? I mean, you know, as, as, as I'm preaching sometimes, I'm thinking, <sighs> people's eyes, you know, close, and I just assume they're praying. Um, I go, man, I wish, maybe if I had some strobe lights, you know, zapping at the crowd, you know, or like a fog machine kind of rising up on big points, you know, maybe then they would listen. You know, maybe then they would stop their prayer life right there and, and listen. But, um, but no, we want to put it back on ourselves, don't we? Like, oh, I didn't present that right, or oh, man, maybe I went too deep. That's your job, just like with Isaiah, that Paul quoted Isaiah here. Did you catch that? And if you go back and read Isaiah 6, kind of 1 through 10, you'll kind of see what he's talking about. You know, God's call calling Isaiah, and he's like, who shall send? He says, send me, Lord, send me, and we kind of stop right there, and we don't read the rest of the text, and we want, we want to use that to say, oh, I'll go, I'll go. Well, with Isaiah, he's like, well, how long should I preach? The rest of your life. Well, who's going to hear me and listen to me? Really, no one. You just got to go, oh, you know that? <laughs> okay. Right? I mean, we kind of want to go, well, maybe send me? You know, is there anybody else? You know, I don't want to be the only one raising my hand, right? <clears throat> but like Isaiah, Paul wasn't called to be fruitful. He was called to be faithful. And as Christians, we want to see the fruit and everything, right? We want to see all these people coming following us. But we are called to make disciples, called to teach people the Bible. We're called to be faithful. We don't have, the fruit comes from the Lord. So whether we're a small church and you just see other ones bursting, it doesn't matter. I love our churches. Absolutely love them. I see people growing. I see people knowing their Bible. I see 20, 20 year old females <laughs> taking courses online, wanting to know the Bible. That's exciting to me. When we get to have community groups and people, you know, we, we have this one lady in our community group and we call it, you know, she, all right, you got the question of the week. You know, she always has questions. And I love it. They're deep theological questions. And it's fantastic. That means she's thinking about it. That's awesome. We don't have to have the fruit. That comes from the Lord. But we're called to be faithful. And that means presenting the gospel faithfully. Because it's really easy to change it and make it saying, oh, God's going to bless you. You know, if you're going to prosper, you're going to be healed. If you have faith, you just got to have faith. And it's all on you. No. Even in trials and tribulations, we're still called to be faithful. So, Right there in verse 27, I want to point one thing out. You know, after he goes through and he says, you know, and understand with their heart and turn, I would heal them. What's he going to heal us from? Because we take this so out of context. Is he going to heal us of sickness, disease, all of our trials and troubles and tribulations? No, what he's talking about is that he's going to heal them of their sin. That's what he's going to heal them of. John Bunyan puts it beautifully. He says, if he hides the sin or lessens it, he is faulty. So if he just lessens your sin, but yet he's claiming to take it all away, 
and he's at fault. He's a liar. If he leaves it still upon us, we die. For the wages of sin is death. He, he goes on to say, he must then take our iniquity to himself and make it his own and so deliver us. You're being delivered from sin on the day of judgment is him healing you of your sin. That's what he's talking about. So the gospel is the only way to be healed from our sin. So as we go to preach, as we preach locally, that's how we it kind of that's how we need to be preaching in those four ways. But he doesn't stop there. He's, he goes on that, to explain that we must preach globally. Verse 28 through 30. He says, Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So in Acts 1, 3, Luke explains that, or as Jesus' ascension, he says that you should go Proclaim to Jerusalem first and to the ends of the earth the kingdom of God. That's in Acts 1. He then ends the book of Acts with telling people that Paul was preaching the kingdom of God. That's significant to us to say that it begins with Jesus and it ends with Jesus. But Paul, or Luke, at Luke finishes Acts in a weird way. You know, he didn't focus on the death of Paul. But he kind of just chops it off right there. Why? Because the kingdom of God is not fulfilled yet. And Luke wants it to be all about the kingdom of God. If we finish the story of Paul, Paul eventually... We, we believe that he was actually released because there was no charges. The Jews had nothing to bring to him. They, they didn't even have a letter. So you can imagine how Paul's felt. Like, I'd, I'd literally been in prison for four to five years, and seriously, y'all didn't even come to Rome or send letters to bring charges against me. I mean, thanks, guys, right? Brothers. Right. Um, but it's believed that Paul actually went to Spain on another missionary journey and then came back to Rome on his fifth missionary journey, in which Nero was actually uh, king there, and there was a great fire in Rome, and there was a great persecution, and Paul was beheaded, and Peter was eventually crucified upside down. So that's kind of how it ends with Paul. But with the kingdom of God in mind, we're still to continue preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. In Acts 1.8, he says, Jesus goes on to commission his apostles to go to the ends of the earth. They're still unreached people's group. Rome was just the center. Go to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We're not alone as we go on mission. You're not alone as you go and preach the gospel. You're not alone if you go on a mission and you're faced with persecution of being beheaded. You're not alone. Jesus was resurrected. Paul was on trial because why? Jesus, he was claiming, was alive. And that's how we need to be in the mindset when we go locally and globally. John Stott says, His authority on earth allows us to dare to go to all the nations. His authority in heaven gives us our only hope of success. And His presence with us leaves us with no other choice. We have to go. We have to go. So, what gave Paul the courage to do this? What can give us the courage? to go and tell people about the good news of Jesus. We see that in verses uh, 11 through 16. 
He says, after three months we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Patoli. And there we found brothers, and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to, into Rome, kind of the outskirts of Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, they came as far as form of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. And on seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who guarded him. So as soon as Paul arrived on the outskirts of Rome, he sees his brothers in Christ. He stayed there seven days conversing with them. Then as they are traveling, I think it's about 140, 160 mile, just simple walk, you know, to Rome. About 43 miles out, there's some more brothers that came from Rome to meet him. Then 33 miles out, the three taverns, there was more brothers to walk with him on his journey. As Christians, we're not called to be lone wolves. Your brothers and sisters in Christ matter to you. They encourage you. They give you encouragement. My favorite time is actually when I'm getting to sit down and have dinner with our, my brothers in Christ, and we talk about theology and how it's affected them. So you can just imagine the encouragement. Paul thanked God for his brothers in Christ. We need to be thankful for our brothers in Christ, especially when we come to gatherings, meet in community groups, or when we're going through trials and struggles. We need to encourage others. The gospel gives encouragement. The good news of Jesus does. To end, Horatius Bonar, early church father. I love, I love church history. He says, God labored on. Spend and be spent. Your joy to do the Father's will is the way the Master went. Should not the servant read it still? Look to Jesus, follow him, study his word is what Horatius Bonar is saying. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word that is, it gives encouragement. God, I pray that that's what we can be to each other as we study your word, as we hear the words that was written down by the apostles, by Luke. God, move us, send your spirit here, change us, make us to love you. God, that even if it requires our life, let us spend and be spent for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus, knowing that this is not the end, but the good work you started in us, you will bring it to completion. Send your spirit here. Move our hearts of stone, God. Help us repent of sin. Let us even see our sin. God, even if it's trying to hide deep in our lives, let us break it off. Let us cling to the gospel. God, knowing that there's forgiveness in Jesus. Lord, we love you. Teach us to love you more today. Be with us as we sink. Let us praise your name. Amen.